Our Father, we are aware of uh, the brevity of life, and we are aware of the acceleration of life. The older we get, the faster it goes. It was Moses in, in Psalm 90 who said, As for the days of our lives, they contain 70, or if due to strength, 80 years. Uh, its pride is but labor and sorrow, but soon it is gone, and we fly away. When we are, when we are young, life goes by so slowly. And as we go through the decades, it picks up speed exponentially. We, 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 are, we, are, we are staggered at how fast it goes by. We want, to, we want to live well, and we want to finish strong. We, we have all, Lord, uh, made decisions. We have taken turns in the road that if we had it to do over again, we would do them, we would do them differently. But the past is the past. And because we have come to know you through your son, Jesus, and you have rescued us from our sins and from our old life, and you have regenerated us by the power of the Holy Spirit and given us new hearts, well, you say we are new creatures. If any man is in Christ, we're new creatures. We've been born again. Uh, this is why we're here on a Wednesday night with plenty going on in our lives, plenty of traffic, plenty of work, plenty of responsibilities, plenty of emails. But here we are to open your word because we want to live well and we want to live wisely. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom and let not the mighty man boast of his might. And let not the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he knows and understands me. We want to know you. We are so grateful that you know us and that you love us. You forgive us. You pick us up. You care and you carry. You save and you sustain. You promise and you perform. What a great God you are. We, uh, we come from different circumstances, from different situations. Some, uh, quite frankly, are doing better than others just because of where they are in life at this particular point. For some, it's a good season. It's a good stretch of road. For others, it's extremely frustrating. And it's, and it's a hard road right now. Either way, we need you. Either way, we need you. Instruct us tonight, encourage us, calm our fears and our anxieties. Give us perspective that will quiet our hearts. There is nowhere else we can go to find that except in you. So we come with open hands and we say we are needy. And you've said you'll supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. So we give thanks to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
So we're finishing Philippians. Last week, we were in Philippians 4, 1 through 10. And in essence, what we did last week, really the heart of that section to me is Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Let's take a look at it just by way of review. Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. By the way, and I, would, I said this last week, I'd say it again. As you're here tonight, you're sitting in your chair, and as you were walking in, as you were driving in, what are you anxious about? Because we're all, we've all got something. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And last week we stated that in actuality, there can be no significant peace in the life of a Christian apart from the sovereignty and the goodness of God. In other words, if God is not absolutely sovereign, Psalm 103, his throne is in the heavens, his sovereignty rules over all, sovereignty is absolute control, that God is in control of all things. Not most things, all things. All things. The book of Daniel is about the sovereignty of God over human rulers and, and, and nations. Because we tend to think that human rulers and human nations, I've never used the term before, human nations. I'm just stopping to think where that came from. We tend to think that, that human leaders, political leaders, and nations that they lead, we think that those forces are the most powerful forces in the world. And we tend to think that they determine the destiny of our lives and the future of our children and our grandchildren. That's how we tend to think. But that is not true. If you think that human leaders control your destiny, you will have no peace. You might find it in cocaine. You might find it drinking uh, Jim Beam. You might find it Whatever, you know, watching sports 24-7, um, doing fantasy football. You might find it by escaping a, a, uh, a counterfeit peace, but you won't find any peace of the heart. You won't find any peace of the soul apart from the sovereignty and goodness of God. Okay. Tonight, the passage that we're in, I'm not going to read the whole passage right now, but I want to read a section of 410 to 23. Let me just read uh, verse 11 and 12 and 13. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along in humble means. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What I'd like to state tonight is that just as there is no peace apart from the sovereignty and goodness of God, there is no contentment. There is no genuine contentment. There is no contentment of the heart apart from the providence of God. Now, we live in an interesting age in terms of Christians and what Christians believe. I, I, uh, 
I, I, I've said this before, and I'm, I'm about to say it again. I don't know how many years ago, seven, eight, something like that. I did a conference for a church, a weekend conference, and at one of the, you know, and throughout it, I was talking about, I talked about God's sovereignty, I talked about God's goodness, and I did a certain section on God's providence. Um, the providence of God is the invisible hand of God. Uh, if, if you want to see the providence of God, if you want to read about it and get a thrill, just an absolute thrill, read the book of Esther. The word God is never mentioned in Esther. But God is all over that book. <laughs> it's, just the, it's just the invisible hand. He runs it. He owns it. He owns kings. He owns nations. He owns the world. He owns it all. So I, I did this thing, and I don't know, a couple months later, I'm having breakfast or something at a restaurant in that same area, and I see the pastor and a couple of the staff guys. And they walked by and said, hi, and how you doing? And, 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 then as in, and then as they were leaving, a little bit later, he came by and he said, hey, um, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. He said, run that providence of God stuff by me one more time. What is that? I thought, man. Good guy. But he's leading the flock. And he was not quite sure on the providence of God. I think the reason he wasn't quite sure on the providence of God is that whoever taught him wasn't up on the providence of God. Wherever he went to seminary, wherever they weren't up on the providence of God. I'm going to tell you something. The sovereignty of God, the providence of God, they are foundational principles. And without those principles, I'm telling you, there is no peace and without those principles, there is absolutely no contentment. They're critical. In the forward to a book on providence by one of the old Puritan pastors, Obadiah Sedgwick, if you're looking for a name for your, your little son, <laughs> funny how names come around, isn't it? Uh, in the foreword to this book, Joel Beakey writes these words, okay? And, and, and the section is called Providence and the Modern Man. Okay, and, and, and listen, if you're not clear on providence, that's okay. It can be learned. It's in the scriptures. For some reason, I, I'm going to say in the last hundred years, in evangelical Christianity, the providence and sovereignty of God have really not been emphasized. We tend to be more man-centered than we are God-centered. We tend to think great thoughts of men and small thoughts of God. It's the reverse. And the more you can reverse the process of thinking that men and nations are great and God is small, that's where we all start. But the more you can fight that and beat it and get it right in your heart and in your mind, man, <laughs> your life's going to improve dramatically and your stress level's going to go down, no matter wh what's going on in your life, you see. All right, so Beaky writes this introduction, and I want to read it to you because it's going to get us in. It's going to get us into Philippians 4. I, I got to kind of make a case to get into Philippians 4, 10 through 22, because I remember early on, years ago, it, this passage on the contentment, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I mean, I knew it was inspired by God, I knew it was the Word of God, it kind of baffled me, because I couldn't quite, I couldn't get my arms around it. I had a lot of anxiety, I had a lot of worry, I mean, I'm a young guy, I'm going to seminary. Uh, I'm in my first church, I'm anxious, I'm uptight, I can't sleep at night, I'm a nervous wreck, I eventually went into depression, and, you know, did I believe this text? Yeah, I actually taught through Philippians then. Did I understand it? No. No, I didn't. I wanted to, but I just didn't. You know why? Because I, I was aware of the sovereignty of God. 
I was aware of the providence of God, but it hadn't gotten into me. It, it, hadn't, uh, it hadn't infiltrated my heart and my soul and my mind because it was so foreign to, I think, how, how I was taught I, was, I heard it, but it was a watered-down version. You don't want to water down God's sovereignty. You don't want to water down God's providence. You want, to, you want it straight. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So Beaky writes these words. As science has advanced, the relationship between secondary causes and their effects in the world has become better known. What do you mean? He, he, first, causes, first cause would be God. God, okay? Second cause, uh, God controls weather, okay? Second cause is jet stream. Uh, God works through second causes, but God is the fountain of all life and the creator of all life and the sustainer of all life. Okay? Amos 3, 6. Can a calamity come upon a city unless the Lord sends it? That's what you call drinking straight. Okay? Because it raises all kinds of questions. But a little explanation. As science has advanced, the relationship between secondary causes and their effects in the world has become better known. <laughs> Sadly, this has led many to ascribe the working of all things to the creature, whether under the laws of science or forces of nature, and has resulted in robbing the first cause, the creator and sustainer of all things, of the glory that belongs to him alone. Now watch this. Christians who believe that everything is working together for their good find it impossible to take a naturalistic view of the world in its past, present, or future. It's not Mother Nature running the show. It's not impersonal blind forces. They ascribe the preserving and governing of all things to the most holy, wise, and powerful working of divine providence. This supernatural worldview in which the whole of life is regarded as being guided by God's caring expression is expressed in Psalm 32, 8, where God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. His eye is upon us. Parenthetical comment here. His eye is on you. It's on me. It's on the whole world. It's on all things. Beaky goes on and says, the greatest events... You ADD guys, get back here with me. All right, I don't want you to miss this. All right? The greatest events and the smallest details of life, the most joyful situations and the most adverse circumstances, the most virtuous deeds and the most vicious actions of men are all guided by the eye of providence for the eternal well-being of God's people. There you go in a nutshell. Thus, when the psalmist calls upon the righteous to be glad in the Lord and rejoice, it is not a weak invitation to think positively about the future, so all will be well, but an imperative that calls for satisfied jubilation in the Lord. Knowing that such things, you still with me? Knowing that all things are under the guiding hand of providence should never lead to the idea that how one lives makes no difference. He who rules all things is the moral governor of the world. And as such, God weighs our actions and repays them accordingly. He who is all-knowing makes the sins of sinners known. He also causes the rewards of the righteous to go before them. The lessons of providence may be clearly learned in the histories of individuals, families, societies, churches, and nations. And as wisdom beckons men to heed her voice, she says, whoever is wise 
and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. That's Psalm 107, verse 43. Let me read that again. Whoever is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Uh, that's talking of the providence of God, that he governs all things, that he rules all things, that he, that he rules your life, he governs my life, he governs the whole world. He's, and see, whoever is wise and will observe these things, that man is not in charge, God's in charge, ah, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Um, I'm pausing on purpose because I'm editing. So uh, this week, I come across this book. I have so many books on Winston Churchill, I swore I'd never buy another one. <laughs> I got a whole section. I got a whole... So this week, I bought another one. And here's why I bought it. I read a review of this book. It's called God and Churchill, written by Jonathan Sandys and Wallace Henley. Uh, Sandys is the great-grandson of Winston Churchill. Uh, Wallace Henley is a pastor at Second Baptist Houston, uh, who's done a lot of writing over the years. But the subtitle is what got me. God and Churchill, How the Great Leader's Sense of Divine Destiny changed his troubled world, and offers hope for ours. I saw it reviewed. I clicked on Amazon Prime and got it two days later with no shipping. It caused my heart to rejoice. Um, it's stated that um, a lot of biographers of Churchill try to make the case he was agnostic or atheist, in a sense. They take quotes from when he was in his 20s, kind of in that rebellious phase. But um, that's not the whole picture. I'm, I'm fascinated as I read this. I'm, I'm fascinated, um, I'm going to read something to you in a minute, but, you know, Churchill's parents basically were brutal to him. His father had nothing to do with him. Uh, Randolph Churchill, as soon as they could, they put the kid in boarding school. Uh, his mother was a, a wealthy American woman. His dad uh, had a great pedigree, but because he was not the firstborn son, he didn't get much of an inheritance. Uh, they, they lived pretty wild lives. Uh, they didn't have any time for kids. Uh, you read some of the letters that Churchill wrote as a boy to his parents, and it breaks your heart. Because one time he went home for Christmas, and they were gone. They went off somewhere. He, he, he wouldn't see his dad for months or months, I mean, for months upon end, months and months and months. And he was away at boarding school, and if he found out his dad had been just down the road speaking to a political group and had left and hadn't even come to see him. Hadn't seen his dad in months. It just broke his heart. Um, in the providence of God, he had a nanny. And... Uh, he called her womb. I think, uh, was it Mrs. Everest? A uh, committed, Bible-believing Christian who loved Jesus Christ. And she spent more time with this young boy and his brother than anyone else, more than his parents, by far. Uh, she taught him the scriptures. Um, back in Churchill's day, in in the best of schools, you, you, uh, you had Bible class. He was always first in his class in Bible memorization. He knew the Bible. At a certain point, when he was, the first time he was appointed to be head of the British Admiralty, 
uh, he, he, he was mindful of what was coming in the war. Uh, he, uh, he had been to Germany and seen the Kaiser's troops, and, and, and he was just overwhelmed. He just, the power of Germany's troops in World War I. Forget World War II, this is one. Uh, he, uh, he went back to his room, and he opened his Bible, Deuteronomy 9, and talked about uh, Israel going into the land and the powerful armies they would face and the powerful people. And as he read it, he put it down and he said it, it assured my soul that God was with him. Uh, did he have a personal relationship with Christ? I'll tell you what's always been interesting to me about Churchill. In Billy Graham's biography, he talks about his first London crusade, remarkable, back in the 50s. Just as the crusade went on for months, weeks, weeks, couple months, I, I, I don't remember, but quite a while. And just as they were finishing the crusade on the last day and Graham was leaving, he got an invitation from Churchill's prime minister. Could you come and meet with the prime minister this morning? And he couldn't. Uh, or it was, I guess it was that evening. It, and then he said, I'm sorry, I'm leaving, I'm flying out. He got another call. Could you come um, late morning? And he went. And Churchill's schedule was very full. And he met with Churchill. And he couldn't, he couldn't in the biography divulge really what they talked about, except Churchill was very concerned about death. And he said, the things we talked about, I promised I would keep confidential. But Churchill was so taken that his next appointment was with the King of England. And, the, and his secretary came and knocked and Churchill said, not now. Kept talking to Graham. The knock came again, not now. Not many people keep the King of England waiting. But whatever was going on in that room was of a lot more value than meeting with the King of England. And you get the very strong sense they were talking about, not the King of England, but the King of Kings of whom he had been told about since he was a little boy by the nanny who loved him as though he was her own child. Okay. We're going to Philippians 4. <laughs> but by setting this up, I, I, here's what I think. This, what, what I'm doing tonight, what I, I, what I want to do is help us get to Philippians 4 and actually not only read it, but understand it in such a way that we can actually use it and experience contentment just as we can experience peace no matter what is flying around us and all kinds of stuff is going on around us right now. Amen. We're watching the dismantling of a nation. It is staggering. The whole world is in absolute anarchy and chaos. Is it not? Yes, it is. So, this is how he starts off. Uh, yeah, he would call the uh, nanny uh, Woomany. Woomany. Mrs. Elizabeth Everest, that was her name. But let me go back. I'm going to read this to you. This is when Churchill was 16 years old, Okay. On a, summer sun, a summer, on a summer Sunday evening in 1891, with the chapel, with the echoes of Chapel Even song still resonating in their mind, 16-year-old Winston Churchill and his close friend and fellow student Merlin de Grasse Evans were talking and having a conversation in one of their dreadful basement rooms in the headmaster's house. The conversation focused on destiny, two teenage boys talking about their future. Churchill thought that Evans might go into the diplomatic service or perhaps follow his father's footsteps into finance. Then Evans asked young Churchill, will you go into the army? I don't know, young Winston said. It's probable, but I shall have great adventures soon after I leave here. Are you going into fo politics, following your father? I don't know. It, it is more likely, you see. Uh, yeah, it, it is more likely, you see, because I'm not afraid to speak in public. And Evans, the young boy, was, quizzed, was quizzical as he gazed back at Churchill. 
You do not seem at all clear about your intentions or desires. Winston shot back, that may be, but I have a wonderful idea of where I shall be eventually. I have dreams about it. Where, where is that? Well, I can see vast changes coming over a now peaceful world, great upheavals, terrible struggles, wars such as one cannot imagine. And I tell you, London will be in danger. London will be attacked, and I shall be very prominent in the defense of London. 16 years old. How can you talk like that, Evans said. We are forever safe from invasion since the days of Napoleon. I see further ahead than you do, Winston replied. I see into the future. Uh, Merlin Evans was so stunned by the conversation that he recorded it with utmost clarity. In a letter he sent to Churchill's son Randolph, who in the 1950s was given the responsibility of writing his father's biography, Churchill continued undaunted, as he would many times throughout his career. This country will be subjected somehow to a tremendous invasion. By what means, I do not know, but I tell you, I shall be in command of the defenses of London, and I shall save London and England from disaster. Evans remembered Churchill as warming to his subject as he spoke. Will you be a general then and command of the troops, Evans asked. I don't know, Churchill said. Dreams of the future are blurred, but the main objective is clear. I repeat, London will be in danger, and in the high position I shall occupy, it will fall to me to save the capital and save the empire. Is that wild or what? Uh, that, that, that's not spiritism. That's a sense of destiny that was put in his heart by God. It's the same spirit that was put into Cyrus in Isaiah 45. Uh, the people of Israel, the people of Judah, rather, were in captivity in Babylon. They were there for 70 years. That's the whole book of Daniel. Uh, no one thought the Babylonian Empire would ever go down, but it went down. And uh, Cyrus, uh, the head of Persia, came in, uh, head of the Medes and the Persians came in, took down Babylon, and it was Cyrus who, um, they were in there for 70 years, but I don't think there was any intent on that young, arrogant king who was ruling at the time of letting them return. But in Isaiah 45, and you might turn to Isaiah 45, you see God had said 70 years and no longer. And... What, what happened in, uh, let's, let's go to, yeah, let's go to Isaiah 45. Um, they were going to return, but just looking at what was going on at that particular time, with Babylon in charge, with that king in charge, there was no way they were going to return. And then the Medes and the Persians didn't go over the wall. Nobody could go over the wall in the Babylon, but they redirected the Euphrates River and they went in under the wall. And that very night, remember the night when the invisible hand wrote on the wall? And he called in Daniel? That was the night that he was called to task and the Medes and the Persian came in and he was killed. And now Cyrus is coming in and he's gonna send the Jews back to their homeland. Uh, this, uh, he's gonna send them back to Jerusalem, which had not been inhabited in 70 years. Look at Isaiah 44, 24. Um, I am the Lord, the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. Um, it is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, all the cities of Judah, they shall be built. They've all been torn down. And I will raise up her ruins again. Um, 28, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, who I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings. That means other kings are afraid of me. It's all they can do to hold themselves together. Um, um, look at uh, 3. So that you may know that it is I, the Lord God of Israel, who calls you by your name. He's speaking to Cyrus. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. I am the Lord. There is no other. Beside me there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me. You, you, you see what he's saying here? He's saying, Cyrus, you're going to be the one who's going to rebuild Jerusalem. You're going to rebuild the temple. You're, you're the guy who's going to do it. 
even though you don't know me, even though you don't serve me. Oh, and by the way, this was written 150 years before Cyrus was born. I am telling you that Cyrus had in his heart a same sense of destiny as Churchill had. Because God works in the affairs of men, because he is sovereign, <laughs> and because of his providence. Now, if that's true, I got a much better chance of being content as I look at what's going on around me, as I look at an invasion that is unparalleled in the history of the world. It, it, it is absolutely remarkable. Um, I've read this before. I love the Heidelberg Catechism. Don't, don't let, we're Bible folks. But we shouldn't be afraid of catechisms because what catechisms did, like the Heidelberg Catechism, you know, for hundreds of years, there was no access to the Bible until Martin Luther came along. Uh, if there was a Bible, it was chained to a cathedral to an altar. Uh, it was written in Latin, and only a priest could read Latin. Uh, common people couldn't read it, so the common people didn't know what was in it. Uh, people didn't have access to the Word of God. All they knew is what they were taught. Uh, Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic priest, but he was a scholar, and he studied the Scriptures, and he knew Latin, and he, I mean, this guy was, and he wanted to have peace with God. He couldn't find peace with God, and he would do all these different works and go through all these different disciplines and crawl on his knees and pray and fast and confess every sin he could ever remember. And he couldn't find peace with God. And then he was reading the scriptures, and the scriptures just, they were illumined, and he understood that we are just justified by faith in Christ alone. And it changed his life. And he began to teach Galatians, and he began to teach Romans. And he looked around at the Roman Catholic Church, and he saw the indulgences. What were indulgences? Well, they, they were building the cathedrals by raising money, by selling indulgences. A guy named Tetzel was going around. He was a big-time fundraiser. And he told these people, hey, if your wife or your grandfather is in purgatory, uh, well, there is no purgatory. But they didn't know that because they couldn't read a Bible. They didn't have access to a Bible. Jesus said there's heaven and there's hell. He never said there's purgatory. But someone told him there was purgatory. Well, and, but if you pay, you know, 100 uh, you know, a hundred bucks or a thousand, you give 10,000, you can drop your wife's time in purgatory by a thousand years. And that's how they're raising money. And, and Luther just was incensed about this. And he takes, he, he, he writes up these things from the scripture, hammers them on the door at uh, Wittenberg Castle, 95 theses, all based on the word of God <laughs> against the counterfeit gospel of the Roman Catholic Church. And suddenly the whole world was in an uproar and he was number one on the most wanted list. And his friends took him and kidnapped him and took him to a far away castle, hid him away. Uh, he didn't know if he was going to live or die. He expected to be drawn and quartered. What happened during that time is that uh, he decided to take the scriptures and translate them into common everyday German. And he did. Oh, and then what happened? It was kind of coincidence. This guy Gutenberg had come up with this thing called a printing press. And Gutenberg got his stuff and said, this is wild, this is unbelievable. And he starts printing Bibles, and he starts printing tracts, and he starts printing sections of Scripture, and it's, and it's flooding the whole world. I mean, just coincidence. It's called providence. The Heidelberg Catechism, what happened? Well, there are these different political leaders in Germany back then, and different princes. And one of them was... Uh, Frederick III, and Frederick III heard about, read what Luther had written, started reading the scriptures, had two young guys who were pastors, they were reading the scriptures, and he commissioned Ursunus and Olivianus, they were 28 and 26, to prepare a catechism for teaching um, the youth and for guiding pastors and teachers, because people hadn't read the Bible in hundreds of years. And they had all these, they're reading, but well, how does this work? And what does this mean? So it was questioned. So they came up with a catechism. It was question and answer. 
And it's one of the most brilliant things ever read. You ever do a small group Bible study? You ever get a study guide? That's what this is. And the thing I love about it, it's a question answer form, and the answers, underneath the answers, are all these scripture references. And in fact, if you want to do something significant, just take, look up Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, you can go to WTU.edu, Westminster Theological Seminary has this. And look up Confessions and Creeds, Westminster, or, uh, Heidelberg Confession. And you can just take question 26, 27, and 28, keep it in your Bible. The next time you're stuck in an airport and you're waiting on a plane for an hour, just pull it out and look up three or four verses and then um, mark them. You see? And I'm telling you something, what that'll do, it'll put these principles in your heart. Am I losing you guys or are you still with me? I'm going to Philippians 4. <laughs> but I'm setting Philippians 4 up. Okay. Question 26, what do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Here's the, here's the answer. Uh, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and all that is in them. Well, that's Genesis 1 and 2. And who still upholds and governs them by his eternal counsel and providence. Huh. That's Psalm 104, that's Matthew 6.30, that's Matthew 10.29. Is for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father? Listen to this. In him I trust so completely as to have no doubt that he will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul. That's Matthew 6. And will also turn to good whatever adversity he sends in my life of sorrow. That's Romans 8, 28. He is able to do so as Almighty God and willing also as a faithful Father. There's so many references here, I, I can't even give them to you. Next question. What do you understand by the providence of God? Listen to this. This is wonderful. And it's a distillation of what Scripture teaches. God's providence is his almighty and ever-present power whereby, as with his hand, he still upholds heaven and earth and all creatures, and so governs them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, food and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, indeed all things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. A slug of scriptures, follow it. What does it benefit us to know that God has created all things and still upholds them by his providence? Well, we can be patient in adversity. If you believe God's sovereign and you believe in his providence, you can be patient when things are not going your way because you believe that God is at work for your good. Uh, we can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and with a view to the future, and some of us are very concerned about our immediate futures, with a view to the future, we can have a firm confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature shall separate us from his love, for all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will they cannot so much as move. Acts 17, in him we live and move and exist. And then there's scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. If you don't believe that, you'll never experience peace. Be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known to the God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The only way you're going to have any peace if you believe your father has the power and the wherewithal to take care of anything and everything that harms you, threatens you, could destroy you, take away your family's well-being. He runs it all. He controls it all. And his eye is upon you and you're adopted into his family by the blood of Christ and nothing can separate you from his love. If you don't believe that, you'll never have peace. But if you believe it, You can have not only peace, you can have contentment. Much in that clock. All right, I wrote something down. Knowing God's providence over history, over the future, over the nations, over the leaders of these nations, keeps me sane when others are at their wit's end. I want to go back to Job 12, and then we're going to Philippians 4, with maybe a stop in Daniel 2. 
I, I think I need to do this because of what's going on around us. You see, God raised up Churchill. Churchill was a man who had been steeped in the word of God. You know, when you read uh, uh, Churchill's speeches, he was always talking about Christian civilization. Christian civilization. Interesting. Interesting. That's what this whole book's about. Now we have leaders... You see, he, he, he was aware of Christian civilization because he, he was raised on the Bible. Now we have leaders not raised on the Bible. They've been raised on the Koran, you see. And that explains everything. Different book, different God. Different view, uh, different book, different perspective. Job 12. Start with verse 9. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, and whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? There's the sovereignty of God. Look at verse 16. With him are strength and sound wisdom, with God. The misled and the misleader belong to him. Okay. Uh, listen, let me tell you what I do. I mark verses. I mark them. I always got a yellow thing with me and I got a pen. And when I'm reading, I mark. And what I do from time to time, like last week, I, I, I couldn't pull up two verses on Isaiah that I had known. So one morning over breakfast, I just went through, I just flipped through Isaiah. Because I got certain verses in Isaiah marked in yellow and I just would flip through. Because Psalm 57 too. Uh, to God who accomplishes all things for me. Uh, I will cry to God most high to God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven to save me. I thought, for some reason, I thought that was Psalm, uh, Isaiah 52, but it's, no, it's, it's, um, it's Psalm 57 too. See, I need to know that verse. Uh, I need to know 56, 9 of Psalms. Why am I doing Psalms when I said Isaiah? Well, I, 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 the next day I went over my Psalms. You see? Because there are certain verses and I was a little murky on them, but if I didn't read everything in Psalms, I didn't read anything in Isaiah, but I just flipped through, and I saw those verses highlighted, and I went over them. Okay. 26.3 of Isaiah, Thou will keep in perfect peace he whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. I need to know where that is. You see? Because they may come and take away my Bible. I need to know where that verse is. And they can't take it out of my heart, and they can't take it out of my mind. They can't beat it out of me. They can beat it into me, but they can't beat it out of me. You see, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against thee. How? Okay, that's Psalm 119. You see, so, so mark them and then go through them. And then they're easily accessible. Why am I doing this? Uh, Job 12 is one of these verses. With him are strength and sound wisdom. The misled and the misleader belong to him. Are we being misled? Oh, oh. Yes? Are you angry? Do you get upset? It's just, it just, yeah? Know that verse. <clears throat> Excuse me. The misled and the misleader belong to him. Go to 23. He makes the nations great, then destroys them. He enlarges the nations and leads them away. He deprives, here we go. Thank, thank God for the word of God. He deprives of intelligence the chiefs of the earth's people. And I say amen to that verse. He makes them wander in a pathless waste. They grope in darkness with no light. They're blind men. And he makes them stagger like a drunken man. And he's in charge of all of it. So now we can go to Philippians 4. And now, <laughs> and now I can look at this thing on contentment. Uh, okay. So, with all that said, and there is a reason I said it, we're going to read in 
verses 10 through 23, as Paul finishes up his letter to the church at Philippi. And listen, here's the deal. He's living under a lousy king. He's, he's living under, you know, the, the Roman, the Caesar thing, you know. By the way, Caesar was a god. So things weren't, you know, real hot for them politically. Uh, Paul's in jail. Uh, he hadn't done anything wrong. He just preached the gospel. Uh, what was going to happen to Paul here, uh, he didn't know if he was going to be released. This was a two-year imprisonment. Prior to that, he was in prison for two years in Caesarea. It was a four-year chapter. He's going to be released. He's going to be given a few more years, and then he's going to go back in the prison in Rome, and he's going to be beheaded. Um, so that's his situation, okay? He's going to talk about, really, um, he, he's, he's going to talk about three things. And I want to give you three principles. And we're going to just zip through them. And I think we can grab them because of the foundation we just put down. Here's number one. Learning the providence of God produces generosity instead of hoarding. Let me say that again. Learning the providence of God produces generosity instead of hoarding. Uh, when, when you see a nation being dismantled, when you see a nation at risk, when, and, and really, what could someone do to put us more at risk than is being done? You see, oh, and by the way, I mean, and take a step back. Only God could have set this up. Only God, because he raises up rulers and he sets them down. He appoints kings. He appoints human leaders. They couldn't be there if he didn't put them there. All of them. He runs them. He owns them. He controls them. I don't have time to go back into those verses, but just know that's in the Bible. We can vote. We're going to vote. You know, you, you, let's vote. I'm all for voting. But he's putting in who he's already determined to put in. And sometimes they're good guys and sometimes they're not good guys. Okay. Because his purpose, he has his purposes. Okay. First principle. Learning the, learning the providence of God produces generosity instead of hoarding. Because when we, when we get threatened, when our nation is threatened, when there's invasion, we start thinking about protecting ourselves. What can I do to protect my family? And, and it's very easy to begin to panic. It's very easy to begin to hoard. It's very easy to begin to get in this self-protective mode. And there, I mean, you know, use wisdom and there are certain things you should do. But on the other hand, you don't want to go off the deep end. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. Philippians 4.10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. This is all about generosity. You were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Uh, not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Now, I want to skip 11. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you revive your concern. Paul established his church 10 years ago. That's, and, he, and he really, he didn't see them. They didn't know how he was doing. Uh, you know, he couldn't send them text. He couldn't email them. Uh, they didn't even know where he was half the time. But they had heard that he was in prison. Oh, gosh. And by the way, when you were in prison in Rome back then... You didn't get an Xbox with headphones. You didn't get ESPN, all the channels. You didn't get a cell phone. You didn't get health insurance. You didn't get anything. And so they sent a gift to help him and to provide for him. Because if you were a prisoner, you were dependent on your friends to help you out and to sustain you and get you through the prison ordeal. They didn't give you a thing. Now jump down to, so they'd send him a gift. Jump down to verse 15. Uh, you yourselves, um, uh, 14, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, that was their area, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. They were the only ones that supported me. They were the only ones who were generous. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. I received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice while pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now listen, these people were in a minority. They were Christians. They didn't have a lot. 
They, they were living under a government that was hostile to Christianity. And what did they do? They were generous as best as they could be. And, and Paul says, listen, I thank you for it. I thank God that he, that he put it on your heart to send it. Uh, and, and he's real important. He, he wants them to know, listen, I love you people. I'm on your team. Verse 17, I don't seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. Uh, you know what's interesting? A lot of times we get fearful. We want to hold on to what we've got. We want to hoard. And it takes away our generosity. But you know, the greatest principle in all the world was given by Jesus. And Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Now, there are times, listen, there are times when there's an abundance, and when there's abundance, you can give more. Sometimes you have a reversal, and you can't give what you used to give. You see? that There are ebbs and flows, and God understands that. But we got to be careful of greed. we got to be careful of a hoarding spirit, especially when we're afraid. Um, in Luke 6, 38, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Tell me a greater financial principle in the world than that. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over. You ever go into Costco, and you see those big, huge bags of potato chips, and you take them to the picnic, and you rip them open, and you got to dig down to your elbow to get a potato chip, because there's about six <laughs> inches of potato chips in a four-foot bag? Well, when they packed them, when they packed them, it was full. But what happens in shipment, it settles. And that would happen out in the fields. They'd have harvest. They would put the grain in, in, in sacks, you see, and they would fill it. But here's, you know, here, you know how God gives to us? Given it shall be given unto you. How does God give? Press down. Here, wait a minute, hold on. Press that down. Shaken together. I can get some more in there. I can get some more in there. I can get some more running over. It's the greatest financial principle in all the world. Uh, I just saw that clock. So I can't say much about this. I want to say this. At times when they're, or I, and I've started tracking this over the last, I don't know how many years. I didn't keep an accounting, but in my head, I've watched this. Generally, when we see a need, and the Lord puts on, on my heart and Mary's heart that we ought to give to a need, all I can tell you is this. When we do that, and oftentimes it's not the best time, when we do that, pretty much regularly we see it come back four times. That's all I can tell you. If I've seen it happen once, I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen at least 10 times, probably 20, maybe more. They were generous with Paul. Here's the second principle. And I got three principles. But see, let me say this to you. Things get tight, and there's all kinds of and people are fearful, and all this, and you know, the worst happens, and oh my gosh, what if this happens in this country? And this, uh, don't hoard, be generous. Somebody has a need, help them out. But, well, yeah, but see, I might need that tomorrow from my family. Yeah, you will. See, that's always see that's always the issue with trusting God. What if I give and I need it tomorrow? Well, then you're in deep doo doo. To use the Greek. But see, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. It's called manna. It's called a well-timed help. So when you give, you're just trusting the Lord that in his way, in his time, when you need it, it'll be there. And it will be. Here's the second thing. But see, if you don't believe in God's providence, you're not going to be generous. And if you don't believe that he's sovereign, you don't believe he can pull that off. And you won't trust him. But he is sovereign, and if he's promised you, why wouldn't you trust him? He said at the end of Malachi, he said, trust me in this. Try me in this. See if I won't open up the windows of heaven. Here's the second thing. Learning the providence of God produces contentment instead of anxiety. That's verses 11 13 of Philippians 4. Not that I speak from want. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. He says he's learned. You don't learn this early. You don't earn this easily. This takes years to learn. He goes on and says, I know how to get along in humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. I can live in the prison. I can live in the dungeon in Rome. Or I can live at the Four Seasons. I can do either one. 
In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I've learned the secret. I've learned the secret. Uh, he says, I've learned it. Uh, we're in the process of learning it. And I want to say this. I believe that the more you are growing in the knowledge of God's sovereignty and God's goodness and God's providence, the more you're going to learn to be content in whatever circumstance you are in. They go hand in hand. I trust you in this, Lord. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't get it right now but I trust you. I've seen in my history, I've seen your goodness, I've seen your favor, I've seen your providence. I know your providence, I, I know your promises. You've been faithful to me. Paul, Paul had been a believer for 30 years. He looked back on his life and he'd gone through things and every time he'd gone through something, God had gotten him through. He'd seen the faithfulness of God. Have you not seen the faithfulness of God? Yeah, oh, I'm not where I want to be right now. There's a reason you are f right now where you are. There are lessons to be learned. So, Lord, help me to learn the lessons. And I trust you at the right time, you, you will change this situation in the, in the interim. Let me be teachable and help me to be content. Not grumble, not be angry, not be upset. Help me just to trust, to trust and obey. Okay. Number three, learning the providence of God. Learning the providence of God produces amazement instead of despair. They wrote this letter because they were very, very concerned the most powerful preacher on the face of the earth was in prison. And he'd been locked up pretty much for four years. Now, that doesn't make sense. You take, you take the Apostle Paul, why would you lock him up for four years? Because we need to get the gospel out. Isaiah 55, 8, my ways are not your ways. You ever heard of John Bunyan? John Bunyan was an incredibly powerful preacher in England. Incredibly powerful. He was so powerful, the authorities came in and said, you gotta quit, you gotta quit preaching the gospel. We're gonna put you in jail. And by the way, John, the day you promise us you won't preach the gospel, we'll let you out. His family became destitute. He had a little girl that was born blind, and every time she would come and visit him, and it was time for her to leave, he said it was like someone pulling the, uh, the, the marrow out of my bones. But he, it was up to him. You can be released as soon as you agree not to preach the gospel. He couldn't do it. But they gave him a second cell, and they gave him paper and pen. And uh, he started writing. How many people would have heard him preach in his lifetime? I don't know. Thousands? Maybe 100,000? You know that his book, Pilgrim's Progress, is the second best-selling book in history? It's all about Jesus Christ. He did other books. Uh, guys, God works sovereignly, God works strangely, and God works slowly. My ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. It's amazing, the providence of God, because right at the end of the verse, the end of Philippians, Paul says, oh, by the way, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. That's amazing. Could Paul, in his evangelism strategy, say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go talk with the head of uh, Caesar's uh, religious uh, relations department. I'd like to go in and do a seminar on the gospel. And, uh, oh, they didn't have that. Were they going to let Paul in to preach the gospel? to people who were high-ranking members of Caesar's household, to the Praetorian Guard, who most of them, the, the Roman Senate was all made up of the Praetorian Guard. Those were the guys that were chained to Paul every day. You see? And then there were the other people in Caesar's household, the servants and the slaves and all that. Could Paul have gone in there and preached the gospel? No, but he needed to go in there, so God got him in. In such a way that everybody was despairing, oh my gosh, Paul's in prison again. Absolutely, he's in prison. And the providence of God will amaze you. It will absolutely amaze you. I've said this before. I'll say it again. The greatest things that God has ever done for me have come out of the greatest disappointments in my life. The greatest disappointments. So you know what I'm trying to learn from that? Is that when I get disappointed now, I need to be really, really careful not to go into depression, 
not to get angry, not to grumble. But I've seen God work so many times in disappointment. What, and what I used to do, I used to think all was lost. Now I'm thinking, this is going to be really wild to watch because I can't see any possible way for this to be fixed. And then what he does is he makes a way. And his name is praised. I think that's how we learn to be content. And I'll tell you what, it's the only way to live. We're in good shape, guys. He's running the show. His eye is upon us. Be encouraged. Go home and eat a cheeseburger. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for who you are. Unbelievable. Unbelievable who you are, what you have done. That we know you. That you've redeemed us. That you've got a future. Not just long-term, but immediate future. You've got our back. You've got us covered. You've got our front. You've got our flanks. We say thank you. We don't know what's coming. We, we're scheduled to meet in 2016. We've got Thanksgiving and Christmas between now and then. With this, uh, with this atmosphere in this country right now and in the world, we don't know what's coming. We don't know what's around a corner. We, we have no clue. But you have not given us a spirit of fear, but that of power and love and sound thinking. We trust in you, O oh Lord. You are our God. Our times are in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.